hate life. What kind of church is this? This is week three and you're here. How's your hate life? We're doing this series because partly at least we live at a time and in a culture where there is an image of God that gets kind of imposed upon Christianity. It's kind of like the culture tells the church what God should be like. And culture tells the church this. Your God is supposed to be love. And what they mean by this is not what the Bible means by this, but, but a sort of sentimental, all-accepting, wishy-washy, God who doesn't make any judgments, just a real nice guy. We live at a time where there's that image that's being pressed upon us, upon the church. This is what your God looks like. This is how you should behave. And you can have that kind of God as long as you don't read the Bible or any kind of Christian history or tradition because, because that God doesn't exist in the pages of the Bible. And in the Bible, what we find is a God who is, who is love, but who is a holy kind of love. He is a love that burns with a passion. And, and we want this kind of God. We, we declare this kind of God is good in a world that has suffering and evil and injustice. In it. We want a God who sees those things and gets angry at those things. And so we thought, let's do a series that will help us tap back into that God, help remind us that we have a God of this kind of passion, help remind us of things like this, like the psalmist says, let those who love the Lord hate evil. To love God, to be a follower of God, is to, is to hate evil. Or as Ken put it the first week, which I think is a great tag for the whole series, healthy people hate the same things that God hates. It's kind of a flip on how we usually talk about things, and it's meant to be maybe a little bit unsettling. Like I'd rather say it a different way. I'd rather focus on the love part, but, but the Bible uses this language, and I think it's meant to jar us and, and wake us up a little bit and make us think. And so maybe you've been thinking, hopefully, over the last couple of weeks, oh, do I hate the same things that God hates. And so we got this series from a passage in a book called The Proverbs, and it's just a couple of verses, and each week we're just looking at like a fragment of a verse, but it begins this way. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And then it goes on to list them. And so we've done two of them so far, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and then today I'm gonna talk about this, hands that shed innocent blood as if it's a room full of murderers. By the way, welcome to people online. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> my, name, my name is Pete. Sometimes I get so excited that I'm just talking. I forget, but you're there. I know you're there. Welcome. Hands that shed innocent blood. How much talking could I possibly do about such an obvious verse? How much is there really to say? Well, first, let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about Proverbs in general. Proverbs is what we call wisdom literature. So Proverbs is not just filled with like, here's a whole bunch of things that you need to know. It's, it's a different kind of category than just, hey, want to let you know God hates these things. It's different than that. Wisdom literature assumes this, that there is a God who created things. And that this God created things to have a certain order to them. There's an order to creation, and that means that there is an order to how humans should live their lives. And so it's filled with wisdom of how we can line ourselves up with the order of nature so that we could experience flourishing. This is wisdom literature. It teaches us things like, here's how you should think about money. Here's how you should think about sex. And you should do that because that's what's been woven into the fabric of creation. And so when we get to this list of things that God hates, we shouldn't just read it as like, oh, okay, there's a God who hates these things. We should read it as, no, this is trying to tap us into something that is woven into the fabric of creation. And when it says God hates these things, okay, so what's he saying? He's saying, he's saying there are things that have entered into God's creation that God doesn't want there. 
and he hates these things. And so what it would be good for us to do as people who want to line ourselves up with a flourishing, abundant life with God, it would be good for us to avoid those things and to also hate those things. And so here's what I want to do this morning, because I recognize that this verse may be a little bit kind of like everyone's just going to be like, yeah, Pete, we know we're not going to kill anybody. Okay, great. Can we pray and go home? There's a few things we're going to do this morning, all right, to keep things moving. First, a little sermon, okay, just a little sermon on these verses, a little checkup to see if maybe this touches our lives at all, this little fragment of a verse. And then as we move towards communion, I want us to do a meditation together that will kind of reflect on the themes from the sermon, but also help prepare our hearts for communion. All right, so here we go. Hands that shed innocent blood. Check number one. What would it take for you to shed innocent blood? Could it be a, a sum of money, perhaps? Is there a sum of money? One million dollars. Not enough. Great answer. Thank you. You've been helping me all morning. You knew the title. You got the mil- How about 10 million? Look, she's thinking. She's thinking. Busted. Oh. Nobody put up your hands through the whole sermon, by the way. These are all rhetorical questions. 10, 10 million, 100 million. Is there an amount of money that you could find someone on the planet somewhere? Ah, that person, just kill them and I get all the, think of all the good I could do with a whole bunch of money. No, I know, you're not gonna fall for that. It's good, it's good. How, how about this? How about, what if somebody killed someone that you love? Now you're thinking, well, they wouldn't be innocent. What if it was an accident? What if it was an accident that they killed someone that you love? They killed your child. They killed your spouse. You know what's interesting? God knows the human heart and he knows what we're like and he knows the types of things that we'll have to deal with in community. And so when he's setting up his nation in the book of Deuteronomy, when he's setting it up he, and, he, and he wants to, to keep the nation free from innocent blood being spilled, in their, in their boundaries. He sets up rules like this. He sets up, he says, he says what you're gonna need, you're gonna need to have these, what he calls in Deuteronomy 19, cities of refuge. You're gonna need to have places where people can go that are nearby the main city centers where people could flee to if they were to accidentally kill somebody. Because if somebody accidentally kills somebody, I know what humans are like, and you're gonna wanna kill that person even though they are technically innocent, like they are not deserving of being killed for this. In Deuteronomy 19, it actually gives like an example, which is, it's kind of funny that examples like this are in the Bible. It strikes me as funny anyways, but it says, imagine you go out into the woods and you're chopping down logs. And like, as you swing your ax, the ax head flies off, the, off the, the head of the ax and it kills somebody. If that happens, people are gonna wanna kill that person. And so you need to have cities where that person can go to so that, this is what, it's, what it says, do this, so that innocent blood will not be shed in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance, and so that you will not be guilty of bloodshed. God recognizes, like, you go off into the woods, somebody dies, you come back to the community, you're like, hey, Benny died. Hey, one of your children died. They were playing nearby while we were doing this, and I swear it was an accident. God knows that there's a part of us that will have such difficulty dealing with that that it could lead to the shedding of that person's innocent blood. And so he, he creates like a mechanism within the community. And so the question is, is there an amount of money? What if you combine the two? Somebody killed someone that you love and there's an amount of money. Put the, getting closer? Would you shed innocent blood to protect yourself, your reputation? your way of life to protect one of your children. I think about the life of King David. I think about why did he end up shedding innocent blood to protect his reputation? If people find out what I've done, my reputation as the king is gonna gonna be marred forever. So let me just shed a little innocent blood over here and we can put this whole thing to bed. Is there any scenario you get closer to shedding innocent blood? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully we're all on the same page. Nope, we're, we're above this now. We're, we're good. This isn't touching us yet. Okay, well then let's follow this line of reasoning, which kind of comes under the, the category of do not murder, which is one of the Ten Commandments, that Jesus picks up. 
And Jesus says this, and it's like he's speaking to a crowd like I'm speaking to today. He says this, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. You've heard that said. It's like Jesus saying, you, he feel, I, I feel what Jesus is saying here because I feel it like I'm saying that to you. Hey, don't shed innocent blood. You're like, yes, we know. Everybody knows that. Even non-Christian people know this. Jesus is like, you've heard this said before. You know this. Well, watch. Jesus is going to ratchet it up a little bit. Up the standard. I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which is like a, a word of contempt, like I, like I hate you, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Jesus is like, you heard about don't murder. I'm, I'm gonna change it to, are you harboring anger and hate for someone? Because in, in God's world, they're like the same thing. John, when he writes to one of the churches in his first letter, in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, says the same thing. He says, if you have hatred for a brother or sister, it's akin to murder. So maybe you wouldn't, I wouldn't kill somebody physically, but, but would, you, would you maybe harbor some hate for somebody that might lead to doing something with your hands, not like with a weapon, but with a phone? You'd assassinate their reputation through just a little text, just a little gossip, just one click of the share button. Oh, Pete, I would never shed innocent blood, like kill somebody. But, but would you harbor hate for someone and let that act itself out into the world? Jesus says it's the same, it's the same thing. Hmm. Check number three. Maybe you wouldn't do something, but are you okay with innocent blood being shed for your benefit? When you hear about wars, when you hear about drones, bombs, all of those come with the shedding of innocent blood. What's to protect our way of life? So are, are we okay with the shedding of innocent blood, as long as I don't have to do it, but it benefits me. Ooh, getting closer? Is there possibly any apathy within you that in a world where you know innocent blood is being shed, you're just kind of okay with it? I just know that it exists doing this little checkup, this is the one where I think God begins to speak to us. Because the, the wisdom isn't just to not shed innocent blood. That's step one, like, okay, don't kill anybody, good. Step two is, but do you hate the hands that shed innocent blood? And if you do, well, hate leads to action. Hate would lead you to do something. If you're not willing to do something, then I would argue you don't actually hate it. You just kind of are like, I am slightly bothered by the shedding of innocent blood, would be what, what maybe we should say. It's slightly, I'm a little put off by it. But you couldn't say you hate it if you don't do something. And so I think that the, that the move is not just to not shed innocent blood, but it is to become people who protect innocent blood blood. Or as the great prophet Micah says, do justice. He doesn't say think about justice. Make sure you understand justice. Make sure you believe in justice. No. God's people do justice. They see where the world is broken, where like the fabric of God's good and beautiful world is being torn apart, and they go into those places and they start to bring it, bring, bring healing and repair it. They do just, they bring justice into the world. Hmm. This is where it started to speak to me and I started thinking, well, what, is this, what does this look like then? To be a person who, who starts to do just, like to, to protect innocent blood. Not just, 
not shed innocent blood. Well, maybe it looks like this. I know that there's stories emerging within our church of people who, when they heard about the war in Ukraine... And they heard about people being displaced and refugees, people losing their homes and people whose lives were at risk. And they were coming to Canada as refugees. They signed up to be host families and to welcome these people into their homes. There was no church program for this. There was no, like, I didn't get up on the stage and say, we should do this. There was just people who said, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. And I see this happening in the world. And I believe that God would hate what's happening here. And so I'm going to be his hands and feet and I'm going to act in the world to help these people. And they welcome them into their homes and they live with them for a long period of time. It's, a, it's amazing. It's beautiful. What does it look like to protect innocent blood? I think about this, this movie that's filling up all of our social media feeds lately, Sound of Freedom, but this guy named Tim Ballard who gave his life, not physically gave his life, but like gave, gave his work and then gave up his means to, to make money in order to protect children who were being trafficked. It's this remarkable story of someone who was so lit up and passionate about this cannot be happening to children. I must give of myself to this. He didn't just sit back and say, this is a horrible thing. He said, I I hate this so much, it moves me to action. I think about the early Christians. And then when the early Christians, when we say early Christians, by the way, we mean like the first three centuries of of Christendom, of when when Christians are after the resurrection. And during this time in the Roman Empire, there was a practice known as exposure. And it's a wild thing to kind of wrap our heads around. But the uh, the idea was this, that, that children were of lesser value, in fact, almost no value. And so if you had a child that you didn't want, you would just expose it to the elements, and it would die. And so there were places around, the, like on the outskirts of the city and the countryside, there'd be like garbage dump type places. And you just bring your child there and it would just leave it there. And you, don't, you didn't want it, you didn't need it, and so you just left it there. And it's kind of mind-blowing to think about. And, I, and I've heard about this before. And then recently, I, 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 I heard about a, a letter that kind of describes this practice. And I want to read for you this letter because of how, how casual it describes this practice, how casually it describes this practice. It's written by a Roman soldier named Hilarion, and it's from the first century BC. And he's at war, and he's writing a letter back home to his pregnant wife. And listen to just, just listen to how he talks. It's a little disturbing. Know that I'm still in Alexandria, and do not worry. If they, the army, wholly set out, I am staying in Alexandria. Oh, Oh, he, he just wants to let his wife know, hey, babe, I'm staying here. The movie, if the army moves on, I'm going to stay here. Don't worry. Don't worry, babe. I ask you and entreat you, take care of the child. And if I receive my pay soon, I will send it up to you. Hey, babe, don't worry. Don't worry about me. And hey, when I get paid, I'm going to send that money on. You'll have some money. Buy yourself something nice. That's a, good, that's a nice guy. This is a nice letter kind of a little sweetheart, Hilarion. Above all, if you bear a child and it is a male, let it be. If it is a female, cast it out. That's a heck of a turn. How do, what's the rest of this letter? Well, we just keep carrying right on. You have told Aphrodisius, do not forget me. But how can I forget you? Thus I am asking you not to worry. Isn't that weird? In the middle of like a love letter home, if the baby happens to be a girl, just get rid of it. So casual about killing babies. And in that world, Christians, the early Christians were known to find these places where infants were exposed and gather them up and care for them and raise them. We have story after story of the early Christians doing this, of being known for doing this, and of being, the the rest of the culture mocked them for doing this. Why are you doing this with these worthless babies? Like, why do you guys waste your time with this? Your whole community is being filled up with these things that the rest of the culture just wanted to get rid of. Yeah, Christians were like, no, 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 no. 
This is, these are image bearers who, who contain innocent blood. And God hates that they are being exposed and we hate it too. And so our reaction will be action to take care of these little ones. When I hear about this practice of exposure and I read a letter like this, it's, it's, it, 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 there's a part of me that goes like, wow, those ancient, crazy ancient people thousands of years ago. So casual, killing infants. And then I kind of realize we live in a similar culture that is becoming increasingly casual and cavalier about what we now call abortion. And I don't want to divide the room on this topic this morning. And so leaving room for there's a political part of what should be legal and illegal, and there's a debate to be had there. And there's an ethical part about the rare instances of, of rape and, and when the mother's life is at risk, and there's an ethical debate to be had there. Somewhere I hope we can find common ground that the current stats are that 73 million babies are aborted worldwide each year. I hope that we can find common ground to say that is a horrific number. That's a number that I think grieves the heart of God and that he hates, that he looks at that and he hates that shedding of innocent blood. And so in that world, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? To hate that calls us to action. What should we do? What will we do? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice as a response to say, God hates that, I hate that too. Let me give you one vision of where this could lead you as a follower of Jesus. And it comes from a book that I was reading this week about Christian ethics written by Richard B. Hayes. It's called The Moral Vision of the New Testament. And so it's a great book. It's a, it's a big, thick book. And if you don't like academic type reading, don't get it. But, but it's a great book that kind of really susses out the different scriptures and the different debates around, around really hot topics in our culture today. And one of them is abortion. And he, he gives this, what I think is a very challenging vision to the church in how we should respond in a culture that has become so cavalier with the idea and practice of abortion. And just to prepare you, this will be a little bit unsettling, all right? So if you don't want to be unsettled, then just find a different church. I don't know. No, uh, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit, it'll, it'll, it will challenge you. And it, it challenged me when I read it. It was one of those things where when I read it this week, I took a snapshot of it and I started sending it to people. I'm like, hey, look at this. This is, so, this is so powerful. But here's the argument that he makes. He says in the book of Acts, particularly in Acts chapter five, you find the church community beginning to gather. And there's this one passage where there's an emphasis made that the gospel of King Jesus is being proclaimed. And the idea is that like under this gospel of like there is a new king and he's forming a new family, a new community. Under that king, no one has any needs. They're like glued together. Like the proclamation of King Jesus equals no one has any needs. It's like it's, 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 it's repeated throughout the chapter, throughout this section. And so building off of that idea that in the kingdom of Jesus... No one has any needs. Richard B. Hayes writes this. How does this story illuminate the issue of abortion? It suggests that the community should assume responsibility for the care of the needy. Thus, within the church, there should be no justification for abortion on economic grounds or on the ground of the incapacity of the mother to care for the child. The community assumes the responsibility and creates whatever structures are necessary to provide for mother and child alike. Sharing, not abortion, is the answer. That is what it means for the community to live out the power of the resurrection. Sharing, not abortion, 
is to be the answer. If we could all just share our resources more, imagine, imagine what that could do for people who have an abortion because they're worried that they can't take care of it. They, they weren't ready. They were too young. They didn't know, like, they were, it, it's, it's scary. Imagine they knew, no, there's a, there's a place that I could go. There's a people that I could be a, become a part of that would make sure that that was never an issue. Hayes goes on to say this. Surely some churches' advocacy of abortions for poor women who cannot afford to raise children is a tragic symbol that the church has lost its vision for communal sharing and has consequently acquiesced to the power of death. The church's confusion on the issue of abortion is a symptom of its more fundamental unfaithfulness to the economic imperatives of the gospel. Whew. Perhaps the church hasn't been faithful enough to its call to be a place where there is no one who is in need. And because we have failed in our faithfulness to that, we find ourselves in a culture where when an alternative is given, named abortion, it looks so enticing. In this chapter, Hayes also goes on to make this point that imagine the church existed in a country in a time where abortion clinics existed and were legal. And yet they did such a good job of taking care of mothers that they were empty. There's a vision. Not that we would coerce through law, but that we would invite through love and generosity. I feel blessed that I've been a part of churches where I have seen this played out, where I've seen life groups come together and wrap themselves around moms who were scared and weren't sure what they were going to do next. And they said, we got you. We will help. We will take care. We will provide resources for you. I, I know of one life group where a retired couple who had everything before, everything they've worked their whole lives for, finally we are retired and we have means to enjoy this retirement and we are healthy. This is gonna be great. And when they encountered a mom in need, said, oh, we can put off retirement. Come and live with us. It's a remarkable story. And yet I would argue that in the kingdom of Jesus, it should be a normal story. In a world where there are 73 million abortions a year, it should not be a, I know of one remarkable couple it should be the people of Jesus. This is, just, this is just what we do. This is what we have done from the beginning. We protect the innocent blood of children. How is your hate life? Does it lead you into action? Does it lead you to do something? Those are some grand examples. Let me give you one really small step if you feel like, I wanna do something, I wanna do something right, I wanna do something today. Well, we're doing a diaper drive. A diaper drive for Sunnydale Community and the Pregnancy Center, and it starts today, and it ends next Sunday. And so bring your diapers to the church. We're looking for sizes four to six, in particular, those are the, the sizes that we need the most. If you feel like, I wanna do something, I wanna do, ah, I do hate this, I don't wanna do something, you can do that. Buy a box of diapers, bring it to the church, and take a first step. Get out of your apathy. All right, that's the little sermon. I said there was gonna be a sermon and then a bit of a meditation. So I wanna invite Justin to come out and Justin's gonna play behind me. And this meditation is meant to lead us into communion. And so we're gonna, we're gonna pass the bread and the cup. Actually, we, we passed two cups and they're stacked together. So just take the two cups together and it's got the, the little cracker and the juice with it. And this, this practice, this, this, this celebration that we do called communion is for anybody who would say that they follow Jesus who has given their life to King Jesus. If you've said that in your life, if you could say that of your life, then we invite you to participate in this with us. But regardless of whether or not you're gonna take communion with us, I hope that you'll join us for this meditation if this is all maybe new to you. And here's where I wanna focus the meditation. On our hands. Hands that shed innocent blood. So would you take your hands and just look at your hands. 
kind of a weird thing to do. We probably, probably don't often look at your hands. When I, when I look at my hands, I always realize they're getting way more wrinkly than they used to be. But just look at your hands and recognize that as an image bearer of God, you were given hands to produce things that look like God in the world. God gets to speak things into existence. We can't speak things into existence. And so we have hands that bring things into existence. So look at your hands and what comes to mind. You can probably think of good things you've done, the good things that you've built, embraces, handshakes, maybe you worked with a hammer in your life. But we're not going to focus on the good things. We're going to focus on the bad things. And so Spirit of God, we ask you to remind us of the bad things we have done with our hands. Perhaps there have been times when our hands became fists it became a slap times when our thumbs typed something our hands typed something maybe there are times when your hands were supposed to be active in the world and yet they remained folded and you did nothing Think about the things that you have done with your hands and the things that you have left undone and what you realize is that metaphorically at least your hands have blood on them your hands have guilt on them a heavy image it's a heavy thing to recognize the responsibility God has placed in each one of us to be his image bearers and to recognize all of the ways in which we have failed and yet there is hope hope not because we just decide to invent a God who isn't angry, who doesn't hate. We just decide that God is some sentimental being who is okay with all the things that we have done with our hands. No, no, there's hope because that God still chooses mercy. Psalm 106 is an excellent balance of these things. It begins like this. Praise God. His love endures forever. Oh, I can get behind that. His love endures forever. Give me more of that. And then it goes on. And it becomes a confession of all of the ways that God's people, Israel, have failed. All of the ways that they failed to be his image bearers, that they failed to trust him. And it gets all the way to the point of recognizing that they commingled with other nations and began to sacrifice their children. And it says that of this practice, God views this and God abhorred his inheritance. We began with his love endures forever and we get deep into this psalm and we got God abhorring his people. I can't even look at you. You're just so disgusted. I hate what you have become. And so you feel the weight of that. And all the ways that your life is a mirror of the ways that Israel failed. And yet you get to the end of the psalm. The psalm that names child sacrifice and God's hatred of that. And within the same psalm, we eventually get to the God who looks upon his people and says, but I will remember my covenant to them. I will relent 
because of my steadfast love for them. And I will bring mercy to them. You may have heavy hands, bloody hands. And yet the God, the God of Psalm 106 acknowledges the blood and yet he gives you mercy. And the same God is expressed in all of his fullness in the person of Jesus. And so I want you to take your hands away for a second and then bring your hands back in front of you. You are no longer looking at your hands. You are now looking at the hands of Jesus. Jesus' hands. Jesus' hands that have holes in them. Jesus' hands that are covered in blood. Innocent blood. His innocent blood. Maybe you could say it this way. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. But God loves these hands that give innocent blood. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Paul picks up this same idea in Romans 5, and he says, while we were still enemies of God, while we were sinners of God, while we were doing things that God hates, and God would call us his enemies, God sends Christ Jesus to die for us. And so look at these hands, Jesus' hands that have given innocent blood for you. One last move. Take your left hand. This is your hand again. Covered with the blood of the guilty things that you have done, the sins that you have committed. And then take your right hand. And this is Jesus' hand. And take your right hand and just lay it over your left hand. Feel the warmth of your right hand on your left hand. Jesus' innocent blood covers your guilt and your shame. This is what the good shepherd does. He sees us in the mess we've made and he lays down his life for us. And this is what we celebrate when we take communion together. So I'm gonna pray and we're gonna celebrate and share the elements. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that for the joy set before you, you poured out your innocent blood for us. May we feel the release of whatever is in our hands by your blood covering it all and washing us clean. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us and minister to us as we prepare for communion?